So I'm Keen O'Mani, I'm Chief Science Officer with CREM Global. And I'm going to talk a bit about food and drink in the data age. So our story at CREM Global, for those who may not be aware. So we're, we're a data science company that are 11 years old this year. And we work primarily with the food and cosmetics industries, helping them understand what the impact of their products are on consumer health, both from a risk perspective, but also from a benefit perspective as well. We do that by harvesting publicly available data sets in conjunction with maybe privately sourced data or clients data to understand how those products are getting into consumers. And the way we see things and the way we see data science, and certainly the way I see data science, is it's very much driven around decision making. And you've heard this kind of team come out a few times in this conference. And there, there's another kind of more glamorous end of data science, which is like data-driven discovery and all of these mad results that you get if you have a huge data set and you just mine it for the insights that you get. But that's not how we work, and I don't think it ever will be. Everything we do is driven around what decisions our clients need to make, and we both work with both regulators and private industry industry in, the, in these areas to understand what decisions they need to make. And we do that by looking at what data is available to them and what data science techniques you can bring to bear on answering those questions. And within the context of the food industry, I'm going to talk about four distinct areas. So I'm going to talk about food chemicals and food chemical safety. I'm going to talk about microbiology. So those, those are the two broad categories of food safety. When we talk about food safety, we usually mean food chemical safety or microbiology. I'm going to talk about nutrition. And then I'm going to touch a bit about on omics, which is the new area that we're moving into. So whole genome sequencing and metagenomic analysis. Before I do any of that, I want to ask a fairly innocuous question, which is, what do people eat? Which, if you think about it for a second, is a ferociously complex question. If you consider that every person in every geography has a different diet, they eat different combinations of foods in different amounts, at different life stages, and they have different <coughs> dietary needs. So really understanding each individual's person's risks and health consequences of their diet is a very, very complicated and data-driven question. And why would we want to do that? Well, why, the reason we analyze dietary habits, certainly at Creme Global, is to understand things around chemical food safety. So all foods contain chemicals, whether consumers like it or not. So they can be intentionally added things like flavorings and additives. They can be things like pesticide residues. It can be contaminants from food packaging. It can be naturally occurring chemicals, they're all there. And to make sure that those chemicals are safe, you need to know how much people consume of those foods. Equally, if you think about the burden of foodborne illness, which is a massive burden on every healthcare system in the order of billions, no matter what country you're looking at, understanding the drivers of, of foodborne illness in a pop, at a population level requires understanding dietary habits within that population and what the prevalence of different foodborne bacteria is. And finally, understanding nutrient intakes. So what, what's the nutrient profile like in a population? Are people consuming too much saturated fat? Do they have adequate intakes of vitamin D? Again, you need to understand their dietary habits to be able to answer any of these questions. So analyzing dietary data is a massive part of everything we do at Creme Global. And we call it predictive intake modeling. So it's a term that we've coined ourselves, and it's what we <coughs> use to capture the, the analysis of dietary habits and predict what's going to happen, given that we don't know this particular variable. The main input that we use for this kind of stuff are our food consumption surveys. So these are nationally representative data sets where usually done at, a, at some sort of governmental or university level where they have nationally representative surveys. So in Ireland it's done by the Irish University Nutrition Alliance, IUNA, and there's lots of different dietary surveys. They survey uh, thousands of individuals over one to seven days to look at their complete diet and then you have additional demographic information as well. So things like age, gender, body weights, heights, BMIs, and also certain biomarkers of nutrition or even chemical exposure. So things like uh, urinary excretion of iodine, the level of vitamin D in the blood, all of these additional things. And they're really, really rich data sets for mining and understanding what population health is like. Sadly, the situation with availability of these data sets isn't very good, particularly in Europe. Like one of the best data sets in the world is the NHANES data set, the National Health Nutrition Examination Survey that they have in the US. Um, but, and so like some of the best research comes out of the US because people can analyze this data set, but this, this situation isn't mirrored in Europe. <coughs> Excuse me. So unless we have access to this kind of data, we can't um, fully establish different things about <laughs> consumer health in those populations. <clears throat> I'm 
what's cool is that there's new data set sources, excuse me, becoming available, um, like uh, Kantar World Panel, Mintel, the NPD Group, Euromonitor, International, these are market survey companies that look at how people are consuming um, different foods and what the things like market shares of different brands are. And this is, this is very valuable information for understanding how people consume foods and what, how, how you can discriminate in, in a lot more detail what, what foods are contributing to dietary health in a population. Equally, there are like self sign-up initiatives, so things like the, the data donor site or the quantified self, or a cool project that we are involved in called Food For Me, which is on approaches to personalized nutrition, where people submit data on their dietary habits, it gets analyzed automatically, and they get nutritional feedback on how well they're doing and how they can improve their dietary habits as well. So there's lots of new data sets, you know, even things like um, social media in terms of how people adhere to different brands and stuff. These are all kind of novel ways that you can look at what people are eating in a population. And there is no one single source of the truth. You have to integrate all of these different data sets together to get a good granular analysis of what people are doing. So some applications of that kind of data. So one, one is chemical exposure. So I'm a mathematician, so I love putting equations, but this is as simple as, as I could get using all my restraint. Um, to understand chemical exposure in a population, you need to know how much of a food people consume and the concentration of the chemical in that food consumed. So again, the amount of food comes from the dietary survey. The amount of chemical comes from all sorts of diverse sources. So if it comes from, if it's a, a deliberately added chemical, food food industry will usually know that, even though that's their IP. So you have to come up with ways of approximating what that might be. Equally, if it's uh, non-intentionally added, you need other ways of like measuring it directly or modeling what the, the level of chemical might be in the food. And the whole name of the game with, with chemical exposure and chemical food safety is you need to look at, you need to generate a population distribution of exposure. So this is like a schematic of what the distribution of chemical exposure is in the population, usually measured in milligrams per kilo body weight per day. That's why you need all the additional demographic information like body weights and how much people eat of the food. You go to your toxicology data, which again has a whole world of predictive modeling within it as well. That's very, very interesting. And you compare the level of exposure with the safe level. And it's usually something like an acceptable daily intake. And if you find that an appreciably low portion of your population is below the safe level, you usually deem that chemical to be safe for, for, um, for the population. Um, we've taken this question a lot further and looked at the question of total aggregate exposure as well. So, a food chemical may not only be present in food, so the same chemicals can be used in personal care products and cosmetics. There's a move to use, you know, like a lot of um, body creams and face creams have vitamin E or vitamin A or zinc. You, flavorings uh, that are used in food are the same as fragrances in personal care products and cosmetics. You can have environmental contaminants that are present um, in food, but equally, you, you know, it can be in dust and drinking water and air we inhale. You have nutraceuticals that are another source of nutrient intakes and so on. So. We integrate all sorts of data sets to answer this question, to look at what the relative contribution of different sources of exposure is to the risk profile in the population. And it keeps us busy, and it's a, it's a lot of fun, actually. Um, moving then to nutrition, we use the same kind of data sets, but we use it with a very different emphasis. So we've developed a model called Creme Nutrition, which is used to look at nutrient intakes in a population of consumers. And in this whole debate in public health nutrition, you know, people are always wondering like, what, what, are, you know, what are the best ways to combat obesity? Are people consuming too much saturated fat? Are vitamin D intakes adequate? This is, a, this is a model and this type of approach broadly is a very, very instructive way of doing it. So you can look at the implications of strategies around nutrient reduction, um, portion control. If you want to fortify certain foods to try and bring up the level of intakes in the population, if you want to replace certain foods in the diet with healthy alternatives, what is the impact of that? And can we predict what it's going to be? You can. And this type of analysis should, I would argue, would, should form the, the cornerstone of a lot of these debates because they're very emotive and they're very political issues. And we do all of this stuff on what's called a, a probabilistic basis. So in reality, only a certain portion of the population are going to adhere to these new dietary habits because people have freedom, they can do what they want. And having this probabilistic modeling framework means that you can be more realistic about what the outcome will actually be in the population for a given dietary intervention. And we did this very recently in Ireland in a project in collaboration with the food drink industry of Ireland, who are a member of IBEC. 
and 14 member companies that sell foods into the Irish market, most of them large multinationals. We looked at 600 products that they had form reformulated. We bought um, market share data from Cantor World Panel. We got four different Irish national dietary surveys. We looked at data between two time points, 2005 and 2012, I think. Is that correct? I'm looking at my colleague Sandrine. Yes, that is correct. And we integrated into a one big intake model and looked at what the impact of reformulation over this period of time was on consumer intakes. Okay, and it, the, the report was launched by Leo Varadkar, who was Minister for Health at the time. And one of the, the high, there's loads and loads of different results generated in this report, but, and it's publicly available if you want to Google it and download it, feel free. Um, but one of, the, one of the high level results was that if all, if the entire market followed the reformulation trends that these 14 member companies were, were, were using, nutrient in, or sodium intakes in adults and teenagers could be reduced by up to 45% on average. So this is, this, is, this, is real, this is real hard data demonstrating the impact of reformulation. And again, this is, this is something I would argue should, that should be part of any of this very political, very, very emotive debate. Uh, we've, we've taken this one step further as well, so not just looking at, at, at changes in nutrient profiles, but also looking at the, the health outcomes associated with that as well. So some very good data in the scientific literature looking at the dose-response relationships with certain nutrients and certain health outcomes, like the link between um, saturated fat and cardiovascular disease. So bolting these additional models onto our usual intake models tells you a lot about what not just the intake or the change in nutrient intakes in the population is, but what the change in health outcomes is in the population. So it's a, it's a, it's a very, very powerful tool. Moving on to a topic that's dear to my own heart uh, is predictive microbiology. So this is, this is a world where there's a lot of data sitting there. And Food companies, when, when they bring a new um, product to market, they, they, they do what's called a, a challenge study. This is where they look at the, the, the likely shelf life of the product under certain realistic conditions. They do an experiment, they have some formulation parameters around time and temperature, and then they just log it in the database. But this, this is perfect data for, for data science and predictive modeling. So if, if you bring it through your usual tools and techniques around data validation, data visualization, statistical analysis, developing a predictive model, testing how well that model behaves in practice, building it into a software application that can be used then to predict the shelf life or stability or behavior of a bacteria in a new food product is a very, very powerful tool then for understanding, for, or for, for developing new products. So and we develop, develop these kind of bespoke applications all the time. Um, and what they mean is that you can, you can bring your product to market a lot faster, you can reduce the amount of challenge studies that you need to do, and you save an awful lot of money. So again, predictive modeling um, in microbiology is a, is a very, very useful tool, and it's a very old area as well, actually. It's over 100 years old. So data science is very new field, but people who are into mathematical modeling and statistics know that a lot of this stuff has been around for quite a while. Finally, uh, I want to talk a bit about the, the, the SAFE project, which is into the area of omics and whole genome sequencing. And this is a project that we started in just April of this year, and SAFE stands for the Sequencing Alliance for Food Environments. Um, it's a project that's funded by Enterprise Ireland under their Innovation Partnership Program. It's coordinated by Food for Health Ireland and our main research partner is UCD Centre for Food Safety led by Professor Seamus Fanning. There are uh, four powdered infant grade <coughs> dairy producers in the project, Kerry Foods, Glanbia, Dairy Gold and Mead Johnson. We have the largest producer of ready to eat meats in Europe under Dawn Farm Foods. And we also have a smaller company called Nutrition Supplies who uh, make very kind of precisely formulated nutrient formulations that they sell on to consumer product companies. And what we're doing in this project is what's called molecular surveillance. So molecular surveillance is where rather, so what they do in traditional food safety in a food, env food environment is they go in, they have certain bacteria that they're worried about, like Listeria, Salmonella, E. coli, they go in and measure them and they, they, they culture it in the lab and they see whether it's there or not. Omics technologies and next generation sequencing allows us to go a lot further beyond this. So again, bioinformatics is an area where data science is, is, is a lot more mature and there are 
lot, they've been dealing with large volumes of data and algorithms for, for a much longer period of time. And we're, we're going to analyze the data from our molecular surveillance in, in two different ways. So one is whole genome sequencing. Uh, whole genome sequencing allows you to learn a lot more about the genome of the different bacteria that you're looking at and see what traits are likely there. So things like antimicrobial resistance, is it going to be resistance to heat treatment? Is it going to be particularly violent? Is, you know, is it very likely to make you sick? So a lot more about the actual bugs that live in your facility. And also, you know, what is their DNA fingerprint? So you'll have a record of the exact bugs that were in your environment. Having that means if there's a foodborne outbreak and they sequence the source of that foodborne outbreak, you can reference it against the, the things in your database and see was it you or not. Equally using a tool called metagenomics, we're going to look at the microbiome of the environments that they came from. So a lot of people might hear about microbiome in terms of the gut microbiome or the skin microbiome. We're looking at the food and environment microbiome. And we know from some very cool studies that have been performed that there's loads of bacteria that live everywhere. And in food environments, when certain bacteria are not present, like Listeria or E. coli and stuff, you can control them with good bacteria who just compete within the environment that they live in. And so if we can develop a predictive model that will say how you can come up with biocontrols, you can reduce the use of antimicrobials, antibacterials, and thus reduce the incidence of antimicrobial resistance. So this is a very big deal. Um, and we're going to be looking, so that's looking at how whole genome sequenced isolates are linked with the microbiome of the environment that they came from. We're going to be monitoring two, over five facilities over two years, and eventually all of this data is going to get collapsed into a cloud computing application. So, um, and allow you to look at what, so within your own database, what, what traits are identifiable for the bacteria that live in your facility, and equally, what, what, what's the microbiome look like? What are the different um, species of bacteria? So finally, to finish, I just want to say um, for a second, how, how do we do all this stuff? So th there was no single platform or application that, that uh, allowed us to develop any of these models, so we had to build one ourselves. I might have seen my colleague, seen my colleague Mark talking about the expert models platform at, at lunchtime today. Expert models is what we use now to deploy all our models on the cloud. It's how we connect lots of different data sets together. It's how we build our predictive models. It's how we analyze data. And it's how we collaborate. So it's how we connect data to data science to decision makers, which brings me uh, full circle back to, again, how we see things. So our technology mirrors our, our philosophy. With that, thank you for your attention.